On our Wednesday evenings, we've been talking about faith like the fathers, a faith that shapes our lives. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, thank you for your people that's gathered here. We want to hear from your word. We pray your Holy Spirit would be at work through the teaching tonight. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Tonight I want to talk about the bad and the blessing. The bad and the blessing. Now I want to tell you the truth. I wanted to skip this portion because it's not tremendously exciting. The story tonight is not tremendously exciting. It's not real dramatic. And it doesn't really seem to lend itself to spiritual application. But here's the problem I came up with. It's in the Bible. <laughs> How you skip something that's in the Bible? Not only that, it's 55 verses, 55 long verses long, this story from the life of Jacob. So you know what that tells me? It tells me that God had this story included in the Bible because it has something important to say to us. So we're not going to skip the story. I'm going to start tonight where I'm going to end up. The whole purpose of the teaching, I'm going to start there. I read a testimony of a man this week who's since become a preacher, but he, he's probably in about his 30s. He was an agnostic. He was addicted to drugs. He was addicted to pornography. He was abusive to his wife. And then he got saved. That's a tremendous testimony, isn't it? But in a part of his testimony, and I, I'm trying to quote him from memory, here's what he said. He said, you would think that once I got saved, my life would have gotten better. He said, in fact, my life got a hundred times worse. How many knows why? We've been singing about it tonight. You know, there's a reason his life got worse. First of all, the world and our universe is a place of conflict. The biggest conflicts is, are not between the political parties, though it may seem that way in America. The biggest conflict is the spiritual conflicts of good and evil and light and darkness. But there's another reason his life got worse. How many believe that God wants to bless us and does, and he does bless us? How many, how many really believe that? You believe God wants to bless us? But the point is, listen to me carefully. This is the message tonight. Blessings do not shape us. Blessings do not mold us. In fact, we pretty much can take blessings for granted. Blessings do not shape us into what God wants to make us. Only the bad does. I may not like it. You may not like it. But the truth of the matter is only the bad in our life shapes us. There's a Jewish speaker I love to listen to. And I had to tell you he was Jewish because... He grew up in a Jewish community, and he's older than I am, so many of the people he knew had, had come from Europe after the Holocaust. And he was talking about marriage, and he said, here's the thing I noticed as a child. He said, you had a married couple, and one of them, one of those spouses was happy, and the other spouse was moody and sour. Get this. He said, I noticed as a young person that the happy spouse was almost always the one that had survived the Holocaust. And the sour, moody one is the one that had lived in America or another European country that was untouched by it. Doesn't that say a tremendous amount? Here's our text tonight, two verses to get us into the story. Jacob says, Thus have I been twenty years in thy house. I served thee fourteen years for thy two daughters. And six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages ten times. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely thou hadst sent me away now empty. God has seen mine affliction and the labor of my hands, and rebuked thee yesterday night. Now, I've got to take time to take this story, and I know you will, but if you'll stay engaged within the story, the truths we draw from it will be much more poignant tonight. But Jacob had called his wives, Rachel and Leah, out to the field because he didn't want anyone eavesdropping. And to his wives, he began to share the bad and the blessing, all the bad things that had happened. 
as he had worked for their father Laban and all the blessings that God had given him as he worked for Laban. You see, for the last six years, God had blessed Jacob. He had become very unbelievably wealthy. But now God has told Jacob it's time to go home. And so calling his wives out into the field to keep it secret, he says to them, Have you noticed how your brothers have been talking against me and how your father has turned cold against me? He said, God has told me it's time to go home. I want to know what you think. He said, Notice your dad has changed my wages ten times. He's always trying to cheat me. He's always trying to get the best of me. And, and, and his wives, though they were Laban's daughters, they knew that. They understood that. But when Jacob got finished, even though it was their dad, and even though if they went home with Jacob or to where Jacob's home was, it was hundreds of miles away. They would never see their dad or their hometown of Haran again. Both of his wives, Rachel and Leah, sided with Jacob and said, we're ready to go. We're ready to leave with you. And then they began to talk. And they said, yes, we've noticed how dad has done you, but he's ill-treated us as well. He sold us like slaves. He sold us to you for labor. And not only that, he stole our dowry. Now, you've got to understand, Jacob was poor. He had no dowry to give Laban to marry Rachel and Leah. Normally, the groom would give an amount of money. But the father of the bride would take that money and put it in a safe place or investment so that when he, the father, died, that dowry would go back to his daughters who were now married, or as insurance, if their husband died, then the father would take that dowry and give it to the daughters to subsist on. And what the daughters meant is, we're, we're, we're glad we're married to you, but the way dad did it, there's no money here. In fact, he's even wasted the, the, the produce of your labor. In other words, they said, our father has stolen and spent our dowry. And they said, you know, we've seen how dad has cheated you. We recognize that. And we recognize that everything you have, God has given it to you. You didn't steal it for Laban. And so here's their conclusion. We're out there in the field in secret. They said, do what God has said. We are ready to go. Let's go to your home. And then there's a little note put in the story that's so important. When they were packing up to leave, they're trying to do all this in secret. They're trying to do this without Laban's children and sons and, and servants notice. And as they're packing up, Rachel sneaks into her father's house and steals his gods. Wouldn't you hate to have a god that could be stolen? She steals her father's gods, these little idols. They're called teraphim. Now, I want to ask you, why did she steal them? Well, there's some, some uh, um, uh, supposing here. Number one, they could have been well, wor uh, worth something. They could have been made out of jewels and precious metals. Or maybe it's because at that time, to have that family's gods meant that you had a claim to the inheritance. It could have been that. Someone else suggested that even Rachel, though Rachel was married to Jacob, she wasn't ready to give up her childhood idols. And if she's going to go on this long trip away from home, uh, you know, Jacob's God may, might not be big enough. She might need her childhood gods, and it might have been that. But there's a little clue in Scripture why she stole the gods. Listen, here's where the suspense begins to build. Do you remember last week I told you that Jacob... When he was talking to Laban, Laban said to him, I have learned by divination, the scripture says, divination that God has blessed me for your sake. And I use the word soothsaying or palm reader. The gods that Laban had, those were the gods of divination. It's not real powers. It's demonic power. But in all probability, Laban used those little idols to ask for guidance and direction. Now, Rachel hasn't come to full faith yet, and she, she has hatched this plan. If we're going to sneak out of here, we don't want Dad following us and catching up with us. 
And if we're gone, he's going to go to his little gods and he's going to ask them where we went. And the little gods are going to tell my dad where we went and reveal our route. And so I'll steal his God so he won't find out. He won't be able to ask them for guidance and find out where we've gone. That's probably the reason that Rachel stole her father's gods. They continued to make secret preparation and they waited till Laban was away shearing his sheep. When he's out in the country shearing his sheep, Jacob gathered up his flocks and herds and he packed up his possessions. And the scripture said he seated his children and his wives upon camels and then they sneaked out of Haran. He had a three-day head start. The word didn't reach Laban until three days later. I don't know who told him, a servant or somebody from the village. Don't you know your son-in-law and daughters and grandkids and all their wealth? Don't you know they've snuck out of town? When Laban gets the word, he calls a meeting of the family clan. And he makes up a posse of all his kins, his sons, his nephews, his cousins. And in hot pursuit, they chase after Jacob. And it's seven days later till he catches Jacob. Now, Jacob has already crossed out of Syria, that's Laban's country, across the Euphrates River, things we're hearing in the news daily. And he's come, he's come to a mountain called Mount Gilead. And on the south side of Mount Gilead, Jacob camps. He's got to restore his herds and flocks, let him eat and let him drink. And it must have been nighttime when Laban overtook Jacob because he waited into the morning to confront him. So if you get this picture, Laban's on the north side of Mount Gilead and Jacob's on the south, not even knowing that Laban is there. And in the night, because in the morning Laban's going to come upon Jacob, take him and his wives and force them to go back to the, his land, land, his house. But in the night, God visited Laban in a dream. And he said, listen, you don't say good or you don't say bad to Jacob. I don't expect you to bless him, but you're not going to curse him. I don't expect you to give him anything, but you're not going to take anything from him. This must have been terribly frightening to Laban, and we're going to see that a little later. But when morning came, Laban rounded the mountain with his posse, and there is Jacob feeding his flocks, getting them recuperated for the rest of the journey. And here is his father-in-law with armed men. Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? Why did you sneak away without telling me? Why did you kidnap my daughters and grandchildren and force them to go with you? Now listen listen to the audacity of this man. Laban said to Jacob, if you'd only told me you were going to leave, I would have thrown you a big going away party. And we'd had gifts and celebrations and, and there'd been all kinds of singing. He's lying. There's no way he would have done that. We know that from the way he acted. Laban went on. He said to Jacob, you didn't even let me kiss my daughters and grandchildren goodbye. He says, listen to what he says to Jacob. He said, you're a fool to have left that way. No, Jacob probably did the wisest thing possible when he left the way he did. Then Laban continues. He said to Jacob, don't you see how many armed men that I have with me? I can make you pay for what you've done. I can take you back. And I would, except for this, your God spoke to me last night and warned me not to speak ill of you or hurt you. Now, at this point, though scripture doesn't spell it out, I'm convinced that Jacob saw fear in Laban's eyes. I'll tell you why in a moment. But here's Jacob's response. Here, here he, sa- he says to Laban, I admit I was afraid of what you would do if I told you that I was leaving. I was afraid you'd take my daughters and children from me. And then this is important. Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen Laban's little gods. Because Laban had said, not only did you sneak away, you stole my gods. Man, sticking up for your gods, that's a good thing. You stole my dog. You're a godnapper. Jacob didn't know Rachel had taken him, and so he said to Laban, go ahead, search every tent, search through our luggage, search everything, and if you find those gods amongst anybody of my party, we'll kill them 
That's what Jacob said. He was so convinced. He knew he hadn't done it. He's so convinced no one had stolen Laban's gods. Laban said, I think I will. I, 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 I'll search. You see, Jacob didn't want the clan to think that he had stolen anything from Laban. It was evident they could look at his flocks until he had. And remember, we're not going to go revisit that from last week. But every animal Jacob had was spotted or streaked, just like the agreement. So they could, they could tell that he hadn't stolen Laban's flocks. So Laban starts searching Jacob's tent. Then he searched Leah's tent. And since he didn't find the gods there, he went to Rachel's tent. And as her dad searched the other tents, Rachel had quickly taken these little idols and put them in some kind of compartment in her camel saddle. So you have this camel saddle with the gods inside, the little gods. Those are powerful gods that can be put in a compartment of the saddle. But Rachel then sits on the saddle. Now, now I'm diverging from Scripture because I don't know if they had knitting back then. But I envision as Laban came into Rachel's tent to search it, I imagine Rachel sitting there on that camel's saddle knitting or crocheting. And dad comes in and he searches all through Rachel's belonging. And then Rachel notices that dad's looking at her in the camel saddle. And so, in the words of scripture, Rachel said, Dad, forgive me that I don't stand and hug you, but the way of women is upon me. So, so that's why I'm not rising to hug you. Laban searched the whole camp. Could not find those gods. Where were they at? At this point, Jacob loses his temper. And he begins to needle, to harangue. He begins to taunt Laban. You falsely accused me. You said we stole your gods. Where's your evidence? If you found those gods, bring them here in front of all your armed men and before all my men and show me that you found them. No, you hadn't found any, Jacob said. This is typical of the way you treat me. Oh, Jacob, he's angry. He said, 20 years because of me, none of your newborn animals were lost. For 20 years, I never killed a one of your animals for my own eating and my own meals. And if one of your animals was killed by a predator, I made up the difference from my own pocket. And yet, if one was stolen, you came and made me pay for it, even though I had taken well care of your animals. I... This is Jacob. I mean, he's angry. He said, I stayed out with your animals. I burned up in the summer. I froze in cold nights. It was so cold I couldn't sleep. 20 years, 14 years for your daughters. An exorbitant price, by the way. And six years for the animals. And during the last six years, you changed my wages 10 times and not to, and not to the good. And you say you would have sent me away with the party hogwash. And then Jacob says it. He said, if the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, I would have left with nothing. There, Jacob said it. That's how I know he saw fear in Laban's eyes. There's two things here. Never before has God been called the fear. Now Jacob calls God the fear. Two things. Number one, Jacob has finally learned who this one true God is, and he's to be feared. But number two, he knows this God has just saved him from Laban, and he can see the fear in Laban's eyes uh, uh, from God having spoke to him. Jacob says, if God had not intervened, you'd sent me away penniless. But God saw how hard I worked and how you treated me, and God's rebuked you last night. Laban said, okay, but whatever you say, everything you have, Jacob, wives and children and animals, they all came from me. They're all mine. I'm not going to do anything to harm your wives and children because they're my daughters and grandchildren. So let's make a covenant. They make a covenant. Here's how they did it. Laban's men set up a pile of stones, and Jacob stood up a pillar. The pile of stones they called Witness and the pillar Jacob called witness. And then here's the scripture. The Lord watched between me and thee when we are absent from one another. I'm going to ask you something quickly. How many has ever heard that as a blessing? May the Lord watch between me and thee. People quote that as a fuzzy thing. Like your, your kinfolk are leaving. Oh, the Lord watched between me and thee. It's not that at all. It's that Laban, you've cheated me. 
And Laban's putting a finger at Jacob and saying, no, you cheated me. And they put this pile of rocks in the pillar there. And the Lord watched between me and thee. And they're saying, neither one of us trusts the other one. But no, the Lord's got his eye on you if you try anything. And we're drawing a line in the sand. You stay in Syria on your side and I'll stay on my side. And the Lord's going to keep an eye to make sure you stay where you ought to be. It's not a warm, fuzzy thing. And so Laban swore by the God of Abraham. And here he does it again. Jacob swears by the fear. Jacob sacrificed. They all sat down and ate together. And in the morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and daughters goodbye. Laban never saw his daughters and grandchildren again. I'm going to give you some real quick truths and one take home and we'll be done. Here's the truths. There's more. Number one, please listen. God will speak to your heart tonight. Even when Satan is hot on our trail, we can know that God will intervene whenever necessary to protect us. Later, it was Pharaoh who, when the children of Israel left Egypt, Pharaoh chased them to take them back to bondage. Now it's Laban. He chases Jacob and his family to take him back into bondage. I want to tell you something. If you get saved, Satan's not happy that you've left his land, his territory, his hold. Satan will pursue after you to take you back into bondage. But God will intervene like he did with Jacob. And he said, Laban, you leave him alone. Amen. How many believes that God is able to say to Satan, you leave him alone or her alone? It would appear that the faster-moving Laban would certainly overtake Jacob and with his extra men to conquer, force Jacob back to Haran. But God wouldn't let it happen. Truth number two, never listen to Satan when he tells you how good he will treat you. Laban said, if you'd only told me you were leaving, I'd thrown you a big party. That's not true. Many folks listen to how well Satan would treat them. They always get treated opposite of how he says there's only one person who will really treat you like he says he will and that's God not Satan here's another truth I had to put this in here other religions go looking for their gods but our God comes looking for us can you imagine this lady said somebody stole my gods I'm looking I'm going to search the tents for my God I'm looking for my God but you know that's true of all other religions they're looking and searching for their God but from the beginning God began to look for Adam. He said, where art thou? Aren't you glad we have a God who came searching for us? Here's the next truth. Accusations will be made. Laban said to Jacob, you've stolen my gods. Satan's very name means the accuser. He'll accuse you to God. He'll accuse God to you. He'll accuse other people to you and you to other people. He is an accuser. We just got to understand that. The greatest way is to live so that the accusations aren't true, but no, Satan is an accuser. Another truth, sometimes we must just suffer ourselves to be defrauded. I go way back to what Jacob said. He said, if there was a loss of one of your animals, I paid for it out of my own pocket. I suffered the loss for one of your animals. And there are many times that the best thing we can do, people do is wrong, people say things wrong, the best thing we can do is suffer ourselves to be defrauded because that puts us in a different place. Here's another truth. The true God is the fear. I'm... I, I'm really concerned that today we've got away from this of realizing that God's name is the fear, not a phobia, not that we quake because he's, he's irrational and he flies off the handle. But God is to be feared. Jacob began to call God the fear because he had learned to fear God. That's not unhealthy. That's healthy for us to realize God is to be feared. Here's another truth. God is at work in each season of our lives. Look at this. Jacob leaves home with nothing. Gets a few days in the wilderness. God appears to him. Jacob sets up a pillar. Now he's been 20 years and he's headed back home. What does Jacob do? He's, God speaks to him to leave. Jacob leaves and he sets up a pillar. What did God do between those pillars? <laughs> He blessed Jacob. He formed Jacob. He shaped Jacob. Those pillars marked a season 
of Jacob's life. And I want to tell you something. God still moves from pillar to pillar. We go through different seasons from childhood to adolescence to young adult, uh, to young married, to middle, middle married, to middle age, to senior. But I want to tell you, our God is a God who moves between the pillars. He moves in each demarked season of our life. So much more to be said that we don't have time. And last of all, we need to establish borders between us and the enemy. Amen. Between Laban and Jacob, they put a pillar, they put a pile. Jacob wasn't going to cross the line to go back, and he wasn't going to let the enemy cross to his side. And I want to tell you, in serving God, there just needs to be parameters and borders in our lives, boundaries in our lives, and say, Satan, you stay on that side. I'm not going to let you come over to my side. And know this, Satan, I'm not coming back to yours because this is a border in my life. There are things I will do. There's things that I won't do. There, there's things I will watch. There's things that I won't watch. There are borders in my life. Amen? Build you a pillar. Put a pile. So, what's the take home this evening? Jacob, when he talked to his wives, and later when he talked to Laban, he could have made a long list of the bad things that happened to him in Haran, and he did. And he could have also made a long list of blessings that he received in Haran, and he did. The truth is, is that in Haran, bad happened to him, and blessing happened to him. If I had to say everything in the take home in this line, in one line, it would be this. Never make a list of the bad without also making a list of the blessings. If you want to stay on track serving God. You see, there will be bad and there will be blessing. God has promised to bless us. I believe that. But he never promised us there be no bad. Please hear that. God has promised to bless us. But he's never, ever promised any of us that there would never be bad in our lives. You see... God doesn't promise there won't be bad because it's the bad that shapes us. The bad in our life is required. We've got to understand this. You know, serving God isn't all blessing. I know there's even preachers who will tell you that. Whole churches will tell you that. You serve God, it'll just be blessing from here on out. They're lying to you. Some churches will promise you nothing but happy. Life isn't like that. Living for God is it. It's not going to be all blessing. On the other hand, some folks say it's all bad. <laughs> I mean, you know, how are you doing? Worse than the last time you saw me. Everything's falling apart. God never comes through. God never does anything. I'm telling you, that's not true either. It's not all bad. And it's not just that there's blessing in the bad. I mean, I like that philosophy a little bit. You know, a silver lining to every cloud and let's find the blessing in the bad. It's not even that there's blessing in the bad. It's not even that there's bad in the blessing. You know, some folks say, take the bad with the blessing because there's bad with the blessing. And it's not just getting past the bad to the blessing. It's the reality that there's going to be both in our lives. There's going to be bad and there's going to be blessing. But the bad God uses to shape us. And to be, speak very simplistic, the blessings what he uses to bless us. Both in our lives. So I want to ask a question of us tonight. Are we merely serving God for the blessing or are we wanting shaping as well? I had this conversation Sunday with, with somebody. And they say that they've been listening to the fair that comes over the radio and the television. And, and how it's always told them that God's just going to bless their socks off and make them happy. And I said, you know, the thing that the Christian world today forgets is there's something God is far more concerned about than our happiness. He's concerned about our healthiness and our wholeness and our holiness. And that's why there's bad in our lives because that is the thing that shapes us into what God wants us to be as we respond, amen, to him. Would you come, music? And so that's a question we have to settle tonight. Am I just serving God for blessing? Or am I going to allow him to use the bad in my life because I'm serving God that he might shape me and mold me and make me? I'm going to tell you this one line of the story prepares for next time. Jacob, Jacob, <laughs> Jacob left the conflict with Laban and immediately 
came into another conflict. How many knows that? He left the conflict of Laban, Laban and immediately encountered the conflict with Esau. I'm not saying that to discourage you. I'm telling you just to prove the point tonight. Jacob's going from bad to bad, from conflict to conflict. But there's something else in there between the conflicts. Jacob also left the conflict with Laban to a new and fresh encounter with God. Because the blessing is with the bad. Amen. I found that people quit serving God. People backslide, turn back in two times in their lives. They quit serving God when they think things are really bad. The other time people quit serving God is when they think things are really good. God knows that we need the bad and the blessing. Could you stand? There's a modern Irish blessing, though I'm not in favor of all these slogans and jingles and all of that. It says, may your life never be as bad as you complain it is. <laughs> Isn't that good? The bad will come because God is at work in our lives. And the good comes because we need God's goodness and help and blessing. So I want to tell you, tell you, church, thank God for the blessing. God means it. It's gracious. It's kind. It's inspiring. It's helpful. It's comforting. But thank God for the bad because it's shaping. It's molding. It's forming. And he's getting us ready for another world. Amen. He's getting us ready for another place. The bad and the blessing. One thing I know for sure, when we finally make it, there'll be no more bad. It'll all be blessing. We will have been shaped. We've been formed. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, you are, as you were at work in Jacob's life, Lord, you're at work even tonight in people's hearts. Lord, if you could take Jacob, someone that had no interest in you, that did not serve you, did not follow you, and you can turn him into a person of faith and belief and form his life. Lord, you can save someone tonight. Lord, you can change them, make them what they never thought they could be because you're that kind of God. We trust in you and you shape us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's find a place to pray. I want to invite everybody to come. Fill these altars and let God move and minister in your life tonight. Hallelujah. Too much.
Oh 